uh, a study on the subject of suffering. And I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2 tonight to start with. 1 Peter chapter 2. After, after uh, giving the initial lesson last week, oh, and by the way, uh, Dan, would you pass these out to anyone who does not? If you don't have an outline tonight, maybe you forgot yours at home or you weren't here last week, just raise your hand. Dan will make sure that you get one. Uh, after last week and, and starting the, uh, the series on principles for... Uh, suffering and why suffering allow, is allowed in our lives. What's the purpose of it and how does it come and, and all those things. Pardon me? I, I don't know, is it? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> it's a different color, isn't it? But, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> you just didn't see your hand, that's all. Ah. <laughs> uh, but after, after teaching the initial lesson last week, and then it just seems like one thing after another after another, quite a few folks have gotten sick, uh, I think it's very apropos that we take a look at what the Bible says about suffering. There is a, a lot of material in Scripture. And uh, if you think about it, the uh, very first book chronologically that was written was not Genesis, okay? Uh, it's the first book that is in your Bible because it talks about, about the forming of the earth. So in that respect, it's chronological. But as far as the time that it was written, the book of Genesis was written after the book of Job was written. And uh, what does the book of Job deal with? It deals with suffering. It deals with uh, losses. It deals with disappointments. It deals with feeling like the heavens are brass. And all those things all together encompass the, the subject of suffering. So with that in mind, let's all stand together. You should be in 1 Peter right now. 1 Peter chapter 2. And in 1 Peter 2, I want you to look with me down in verse 20. Let's read the verse together out loud in unison. 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse 20, it says, For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. One more time. For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if, when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's good to be here tonight. I'm thankful for each one that's here. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for those that are at home uh, because they have to be, particularly because of, of sorrow or sickness, whatever the case might be. We just ask God that you would uh, fulfill your role in their lives in a way that's pertinent to their situation and be that God of all comfort. I am so thankful. I've thought about this an awful lot uh, that uh, it, it was so apropos, Lord, that you uh, called the Spirit of God, which you left inside of us after we got saved, uh, and our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's called the Comforter. And it's in times of sorrow and times of sickness and times uh, of, of, uh, 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 of loss that it's so good to have the comforter on the inside. Uh, Lord, we can, get, we can get comfort from people. We can get even sometimes comfort from things. But there's no comfort like the comfort that comes from God. We pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding tonight as we look in your word and look at the subject of suffering, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's just real quickly kind of do a, a review of last week. 
Um, we started out by talking about who does who on on whom does does uh, suffering come on, and it really, in a, in a general sense, uh, the answer is everyone, and it's on all those who who believe. Uh, it's also on the, the the lost. The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And it's, it's uh, on all who are godly. The Bible says they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And there's a reason why that, why that is, and we'll be looking at that as we go on in the study. How does, how does suffering come? And we looked at, at some of the different ways last week. It comes through our own mistakes and through our own sins, uh, through our own bad decisions. Uh, it, it comes through the mistakes and sins of others. And uh, that's probably one of the toughest ones to, to live with, is when someone else makes, uh, someone else sins, someone else does wrong, someone else has poor judgment, and then we end up suffering for it. But what it really should do is sober us up and make us realize how important our decisions are and how important it is for us to be right with God. And then the third, third way that it, it, it comes is through temptations. And the uh, uh, Bible says that there is no temptation taking you, but such as is, is common to man. And God will, with the temptation, provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And then the last one is uh, through providential dealings. Um, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And uh, er everything has a purpose, and the basic purpose for a believer is that we be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to start with uh, why do sufferings come? Why do sufferings come? In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, look with me again at that verse, it says, For what glory is it? If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but... If, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. What he's doing there is he's, he's, he's categorizing suffering. And he says suffering comes because we do wrong. Suffering comes sometimes be, not because we do wrong, but because it's just it comes into our life. And how we respond to that suffering is what is, what is absolutely crucial. Um, the, so the, the, first, the first category of, of why uh, sufferings come is that they come because sometimes the sufferings are deserved, okay? The sufferings are deserved. That's your blank in there. Sufferings are deserved. And it's a, it, it, it's a result of sin. Uh, let's look at some verses together. Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 with me. And in John 5, look down in verse 14. John chapter 5 and verse 14. This is a story of the man who was trying to get healed at the pool of Bethesda. And in down in verse 14, Jesus is speaking. It says, afterward, Jesus findeth him... In the temple, this is after he's healed the man, and and uh, he, after he gets back up on his feet and walks off, he goes into the temple, and in verse fourteen it says, "Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole; sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee." Uh, and the, the the thought there is is that sin brings suffering. Sin brings suffering. And uh, if, if we uh, make decisions without consulting God, if we deliberately uh, sin against God, then we should, not, we should not marvel if suffering comes into our lives. Go to Numbers chapter 12. Here's a case in point, Numbers chapter 12. And this is the story of... Um, Aaron and Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, and uh, they started getting an attitude about, about uh, Moses. And uh, if you look with me in verse, uh, let's see, look with me, begin in verse 1, if you would. 
It says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they, they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. One of the things that I, that I found, found as I was reading through this is uh, it says that they had a beef with him because of the woman he married. But is that what they complained about? And the answer is no. That's not what they complained about. And that, that just shows you a, a principle is that, that usually what people tell you is the problem is not usually the root problem. They'll tell you a surface problem. They'll tell you something that, that, uh, uh, that you can easily see. But uh, wisdom comes from digging down deep and finding out what the real problem is. And what the real problem was is that they had a problem with the decision that he made with, with whom he married. Drop with me, if you would, down to verse 10. Down in verse 10 it says, And, the, and the, the, the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous. So God made a statement on this whole thing. Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Um, why was she leprous? Because she sinned. And because, because she sinned, there was a, there was a price to pay. Um, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And this is basically what the, this is. It's just simple cause and effect. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. And in 2 Chronicles 16, look down in verses uh, 10 through 12. 2 Chronicles 16, 10 through 12. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, and that's the prophet, and put him in a prison house, and he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa uh, oppressed some of the, of the people uh, the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book, of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the 30 and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Physicians. And so what, what I, the, the conclusion you come to is because of his actions of oppressing the people and of uh, jailing the prophet, uh, God allowed him to be diseased on his feet. And, uh, and, and he, that, that disease ended up taking his life. So, so sometimes suffering comes into our lives because of sin. Um, I, I recommend that when, when you have any kind of suffering come into your life, when you ever get sick, uh, when there's some loss in your life, uh, first thing, you look to God and say, Lord, is there, is there any wicked way in me? Is there, is there a, a reason why this is coming? Now, I'll tell you why that's so important. Because if it is chastening, you get it right and the chastening will stop. You don't get it right and the chastening will continue. It won't necessarily be the same thing. It'll just pop up as something else and then pop up as something else and then pop up as something else until God finally gets a hold of our attention and, and we, we change our behavior. But it's important to do that and to do that first. I, you know, I, honestly, with myself, okay? Uh, I know the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things, right? Desperately wicked. That means you, that means me. And so first question is, okay, what did I do? <laughs> you know, uh, it, is it due to something specific uh, some action in my life that, that God is displeased with. But then, then uh, the, the, second, the second reason uh, is they're either deserved or they're undeserved. Now, when I say undeserved, I mean there's no direct cause and effect. But even though something is undeserved, if God allows it into our life, what is it? Well, it's necessary. It's necessary. It's something that needs to be there to help us. 
And uh, it's, it's uh, again, it's not a direct cause and effect, but God saw that it was necessary, so he allowed that suffering to come into our lives. Um, go with me over to the book of John, chapter 9. Gospel of John. John chapter 9, and look with me in verses uh, 2 and 3. John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. John 9, verse 2, well, let's go up to verse 1. It says, And Jesus passed by, saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is, you know, this is not only was, but still is oftentimes a typical line of thought. You know, well, if he's suffering, it's got to be sin. And that's exactly what Job's friends thought. They said, okay, uh, Job looked outwardly like he was right with God uh, all those years, but there must have been something that was hidden down there that he didn't tell any, anybody about, and now God is, is bringing his wrath down on him. Well, that was not the case at all. If you know the book of Job, that wasn't it at all. And yet that was their thinking, and that's, that's really even typical thinking to, today. That's the, you might call it the bottom line of even this prosperity gospel stuff where they say, you know, if you do right, uh, you're going to get all kinds of blessings. And if you don't do right, then the blessings will all be withheld. Well, what happens if you do right and the blessings are still withheld? Then what do you do? Um, and, and that does happen. And, and it's obvious. Uh, you look at the lives of the apostles. Only one of them didn't die a martyr's death. Uh, even the apostle Paul ended up having his head chopped off. Uh, you, and you can't say, well, it's because it was, there was some gross sin in his life. No, he was doing right. He was doing right. And uh, so then what we need to do is we need to, to look and see what, what, are, what are some of the reasons why we enter into uh, the undeserved suffering. And first thing under number two is that, uh, that God's works might be manifested that the works of God might be manifested. Look down in verses 2 and 3. It says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, you think about this, okay? This man was a man by the time this all took place. He had to go through a life of suffering. Uh, he had to go through a, a life of blindness in order for, you know, and that was many years, how many, we're not exactly sure, but he was a man. And God allowed that to happen so that he could be healed and God could get the glory later on in life. But in the process, he went through year after year after year of, of not having sight. And understand that, that uh, uh, God will, God is, is uh, uh, not hesitant to sacrifice the outer man for the benefits that we get inwardly or for the benefits that he gets through getting honor and glory through, through doing a work in our lives. And the second thing under number two is is uh, the, Lord, the Lord may allow a Christian to be sick uh, so that uh, some things get accomplished. And this isn't in your notes, but you can add it if you like. Uh, the Lord may allow a Christian to be sick. And we've got a bunch of folks sick tonight, okay? Um, why does he allow that to happen? Well, if, it, if, it's, if it's not because of sin, then what would be the reasons? Well, number one, uh, in order to make us more holy, to draw us closer to him. Uh, I don't know what it's like when you get sick, but when I get sick, the world stops, <laughs> okay? It just, I mean, just, it just quits. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to spend time with folks. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't care if anybody takes care of my needs. I don't need my needs taken care of. What I need to do is go into my bedroom, 
uh, turn on the, especially if it's the flu and I got chills, turn on the heat and blanket up to 10, you know, how that goes, and uh, get wrap yourself in a cocoon and then just spend time with God. Uh, that's really all I need. And, uh, and, and he'll, he'll allow us to, to go through sickness and suffering so that, so that uh, we can become more holy. The second reason is uh, in order to have better fellowship with him. Some of the, some of the most crucial, honestly, and deep fellowship that I had with the Lord uh, in, in my life was when I threw my back out and it was so bad. I've never experienced pain like that in my entire life. And uh, uh, I was in the bedroom, <laughs> and that's my retreat place, and uh, when I'm sick, I closed the door, and uh, Lord and I had some time together. Uh, was, it, was it pleasant at first? No, not at all. It was horrible. But as a result of that, I had some of the sweetest fellowship by the time that whole thing was over with the Lord than, than I've ever had. And uh, uh, God desires to get close to us. Sometimes he allows us to go through sickness in order to draw us closer to him. And then the third thing is, uh, so he can heal us and answer prayer and get honor and get glory. Um, you know, those things uh, give glory to God. Um, that's why it's so important. When you hear someone sick, pray for them. And ask the Lord to, to, uh, uh, to, to help them, and strengthen them. To, you know, one of the things I've been praying for for Bob Pennard is that he would recuperate faster than what they expected. And according to uh, Mrs. Pennard, she called and talked to my wife tonight just before church, and he's doing pretty well. Now, he, he went into that whole thing, you know, kind of shaky and, and apprehensive and the whole nine yards. Uh, I really believe a lot of people prayed for him. Um, when, I, when I had my back surgery, I knew that people were praying for me. I could tell. And I'm, you know, I'm not one of these touchy-feely, spooky dudes, okay? I'm just not like that. But, but I could tell that God was intervening for me. And it's because people were praying. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes that, that sickness thing isn't just for you. In fact, it might not be for you at all. It might be for somebody else that uh, needs to spend time with God. And God uses that, your need, to cause them to go to the throne of grace and uh, get help for you in time of trouble. Uh, the ne the, the uh, uh, next thing under undeserved suffering would be for his glory. Go with me to uh, John chapter 11, just over a page or two. John chapter 11, and look down in, in verse 1. It says, Now a, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of, of Bethany, the town, uh, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of, of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now what happened was he got word that, that um, Lazarus was sick, and he, on purpose, stayed a little longer so that he could die. So that he could go, and he already had it, obviously, planned. He's God. Uh, and he, he went to, uh, to see Lazarus, and he had already died, and he, he raised him from the dead. Uh, did God get the glory through that thing? Boy, did he ever. Uh, and one of the, one of the uh, famous verses that, are, is used in, uh, uh, used in uh, funerals is found in John chapter 11, uh, verse 25. Uh, it says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Well, none of those things would have taken place had Lazarus not died. Was Lazarus' death a terrible thing? Sure, because it brought all kinds of sorrow 
and all kinds of sadness to his two sisters. But I'll tell you what, after Jesus visited the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth out of that grave, the sorrow was gone. And uh, God got the honor and God got the glory. And God will allow things like that to happen uh, in order to get glory and honor. Um, bottom line is, if it, if it pleases God, even if it's something like sickness, even if it's some kind of suffering, if it pleases the Lord in the end, then it ought to, it ought to please us. And we ought to, to have the right attitude as we go through it. And then the, 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 the last uh, reason for undeserved uh, suffering uh, is because in what, what purpose it, it uh, fulfills. It's, it, it's Satan's work, and God can even get glory through that. Uh, over in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said that the reason why he suffered was because a messenger of Satan had a thorn in the flesh and was buffeting him with it. Okay, well, God allowed that to happen, but it was Satan who did it. If you look at Job, uh, God said, okay, you know, uh, he, 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 essentially what the, the way that whole thing started was he confronted Satan one day when Satan came before, before God uh, and, uh, and, and said, and he said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant, my servant Job? And what he was doing was, was bragging on Job and the fact that Job loved him and that Job served him and that Job was loyal to him. And then what, what Satan said was, well, you just let me touch him and we'll see how that goes. And uh, he said, okay, you just can't take his life. But who was it that actually did it? Well, it wasn't God, it was Satan. He allowed him to do it, but it was Satan who did it. And there are times when, when those things will happen. Now, again, you look at both of those circumstances, both uh, Job and Paul. Paul said, even though it was Satan's messenger who gave him a thorn in the flesh, he, he, he said, but I know I, was, I had a tendency to be pr proud, and so therefore God gave me that, allowed me to have that thorn in the flesh from the messenger of Satan, so that my pride could be diminished. Uh, in the, the, the case of, of Job, uh, Job struggled, obviously, I think any of us would, through that whole thing, but he never said anything bad about God. And he spoke rightly about God, and his friends did not speak rightly about God. And so at the end, Job is commended by God himself and the, the, the friends are, are uh, rebuked because what they said was not right and what Job said was right. You know, it's, it's the, the age old, anybody can praise God in the sunlight, but can you still praise God and speak well of him when the bottom falls out and when the, when the tears flow from your eyes like a river? Uh, I, you know, that's when the test is. And those are all, all reasons for and what God does with and through uh, undeserved suffering. Now let's, let's go on to the next, the next area. What's the purpose of suffering? And those two just kind of dovetail together. Uh, what's the purpose? What does God do through suffering? Um, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, modern-day teaching teaches that uh, uh, suffering is unnecessary for Christians. A lot of the charismatics go into that. And they say, well, if you're really right with God, you'll never get sick and so forth and so on. Uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the prosperity gospel. That's false doctrine. That is not correct because God does have a purpose in suffering. But we got to always keep the right perspective when, when it comes to suffering. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. And look down with me, if you would, at verse 18. Romans 8, 18. It says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
I'm not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we've got to keep that, that perspective. In other words, what God is doing on the inside is greater than the suffering that's going on on the outside. And it, it goes back to that principle that God will sacrifice the outside in order to form Christ more and more perfectly in us on the inside. So what are some purposes for suffering? Let's see what we've got for time here. All right, we've still got some. Uh, number one. It's to profit us. Uh, suffering is in, comes into our life to profit us. And really, you can say that that's true, whether it's deserved or undeserved. Either way, it's, it's for our profit. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. By the way, the book of 1 Peter is an excellent book when it comes to suffering and difficulties and God had that written because the people that Peter wrote to were being persecuted they were suffering and uh, the book was written as an encouragement and to open up their eyes to help them to see what suffering what the purpose of suffering is uh, look with me in let's see start start in verse 8 start in verse 8 first Peter 5 8 it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And then verse 10. Uh, and understand, when you, when you uh, fight Satan... When you resist, not, not so much fight him, but you resist him, resist the devil, the Bible says, and he'll flee from you. When you resist him, that doesn't mean that, you won't, that your suffering will stop. Sometimes it increases. But look what God does with the suffering. Verse 10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while. In other words, after the suffering passes, it says, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. If we respond properly to suffering, what it brings is, is it makes us more complete in, in him as far as in our growth, in our maturity, makes us perfect. It establishes us. It strengthens us. Now, and again, you say, wait a minute. Now, that, that, that time of suffering I went through, I, I didn't come out of it stronger. I came out weaker. Physically, you might have, but not spiritually if you respond properly. Uh, Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, when I am weak, then am I what? Strong. Why? Because the grace of God can be strong on your behalf. And uh, as you go through that difficulty and go through that suffering, uh, God wants you to depend and rely more and more on him. Go to, go to uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And the implication in 1 Peter 5 is that you're doing right, you're suffering for it, and God uses that suffering to, to strengthen you and, and to uh, make you more established and to perfect you or mature you. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, this is the flip side. What about, what about chasing? You know, what's a, there's, suffer, there's suffering that comes when we sin and God has to chasten us. But again, what's the purpose? Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, look in verses 10 and 11. And this, this, this passage uh, from about, uh, well, in fact, let's go up to verse, verse 6. From about verse, verse um, actually verse 5. Let's go to verse 5. From verse 5 on, uh, in the middle part of this, this uh, chapter, it talks about, about suffering through chastening. Verse 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now again, if there's chastening, there's going to be suffering. It's going to hurt. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if 
Uh, ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, he only chastens his own children. He doesn't chasten chase lost people. Um, verse 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And down in verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. In other words, to suffer. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So the end result of, of all chastening uh, is, is to be uh, more holy and to be right and to, to be more righteous and uh, to, to get closer to God. That's the whole purpose of it. And the bottom line is it is for our good. And really, as you look at that, you could say that about any kind of suffering for any reason that comes into our lives. God wants to use it for good, and he wants to use it for his glory and for his honor. Um, take your Bibles and turn to Romans 8. These are familiar verses, Romans 8. By the way, this is teaching. This isn't preaching, so because of that... If you have something to add or you like to make a remark or give an illustration uh, of, a, of a point, feel free to do so. Romans chapter 8, just raise your hand so I can see it. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It says that, that all things work together for good. Uh, it, it is uh, for his profit, it's for his glory, but it's also for ours. Um, oftentimes when I've heard people quote this verse, uh, they, 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 they uh, make mention of this. It says, all things work together for good. Everything works together for our good. I don't believe that's what this is teaching here at all. Um, what it's teaching is it's for good in general. What's good? God's glory is good. And so first and foremost, above all things, it's good because it gives glory to God if we respond properly. And if, if we, if we uh, properly react to the, the difficulties and the, the problems and the afflictions and so forth that God allows to come into our lives. Go to Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35, look down in verse uh, 17. Jeremiah 35, 17. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. God will allow suffering to come into our lives to get our attention. Uh, Israel was rebellious against God. And Jeremiah is known as a weeping prophet. He, he not only uh, spoke to them of judgment that was coming, but he did so properly. I mean, he had a broken heart. He was called the weeping prophet because he cried many a tear for his country. He saw his country going down the tubes. Uh, we're seeing that same thing with America. It ought to break your heart. It broke Jeremiah's heart. And now, yes, did he say some hard and tough things to, that, to, to those people? Yes, he did. But he did so with a broken heart. Did so with a broken heart. And he knew what God was trying to do. He was, he was warning them of judgment that was coming, but it wasn't just so, so God could, could hurt Israel. It was so that he could get their attention and they would realize that they had turned their back on him and needed to... to uh, 
to return to him. Uh, they wanted, he wanted them to get right. Um, you see, you see uh, uh, this illustrated in nature. Uh, when I was a kid, my, uh, my dad and my mom took me to a restaurant. Uh, it was, I don't even think it's in, it's in existence anymore. It used to be across the street from Roseland Park in Canandaigua. And uh, it, I think the name of it was Caruso's, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we went in there, and I was, I was just a kid, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, something like that. And I had never, I, I always enjoyed when I go into a restaurant, I'd open up the menu, and I'd say, Dad, can I have this? Because I'd never had it before. And I, I've just always been that way. I'm adventurous in my eating. I like eating something new and something different. Well, they had raw oysters. Okay, and I'm not a real fan of your raw oysters today. I eat them, but I'd rather have raw clams or steamed clams or even better than that, especially dipped in butter. But, uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, I, I said, can I have those? He says, yeah, they're, they were raw oysters and they were on ice. And, and uh, they brought them out. And my father just made a, it makes me wonder if he planted it, or, you know, if he, he arranged some, but I don't think he did because he was as surprised as anybody was. And he said, he said, just be careful. He says, be careful. He says, uh, you might, you might uh, chomp down on a, on a pearl, you know, in an oyster. I took the first oyster and put it in my mouth and chomped down and I says, whoa, I think I've got one. And he thought I was pulling his leg. And uh, sure enough, I pulled it out and there was a little pearl. Now it wasn't very big. Uh, and over the years, I, I have no idea where that thing went. But uh, my dad made the comment about, you know, in order to use that in a ring or anything like that, he, he said they have to, and I can't remember the exact term. I, th I think he used the term, they have to skin the, the pearl. And he says, you, after you skin that one, he says, there won't be anything left. <laughs> he, was pretty, he was right because it was so small. But uh, how, where'd that pearl come from? Well, you know where it came from? It came from the fact that that, that oyster had some irritations going on in it. And those irritations caused the oyster to secrete some things and that pearl was formed. The pearl was formed because of irritations. And that's what happens with the pearls in our lives. The, the things that are valuable that take place in our life often come through the sufferings and the irritations and the difficulties that we go through because we learn some things about God that we wouldn't learn any other way. And there's definite profit. You look at, at diamonds. Uh, diamonds, <laughs> what, is di what did diamonds start as? Who knows? This is easy. Okay, coal. All right, starts as coal. Is coal something that you'd want to, you know, wear on your, on your finger, ladies, as a, as a ring? Uh, when <laughs> when uh, Sarah was here, uh, oh, she... Uh, came in on uh, Sunday, she showed, she, I asked her, I said, hey, I want to see that ring, you know. Well, she didn't, she, she, I believe she had her, her hand either behind her back or in her pocket. She pulled it out. Well, she didn't show me some great big old black hunk of coal. It was a diamond. Well, how did it go from a hunk of coal, which is what it used to be, to a diamond, which it is today? Pressure. Pressure. And the pressure over the years uh, caused that coal to turn into a diamond. Well, your life becomes more and more of a diamond that can glow for Jesus Christ as, as pressure comes into our lives and difficulties come. Uh, and when, when you start to see that, when, when the light goes on, so to speak, it, it, uh, it really helps you understand why God allows you to go through the things that you go through. Yeah, Justin. Good and loud. Yeah. He likes to take ashes and ugly and turn it into something beautiful, doesn't he? And only God can do that. And he does. Uh, but then that's, that's a good point. Take something that's ugly and turns it into something beautiful. But there has to be some pressure. There has to be some, some difficulty that comes. 
Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Uh, we're going we're to stop here and we'll continue there next week. If you've got your outline, just fold it up, put it in your Bible and you have it for next week. Yes, ma'am. Michael Ann. Yeah, yeah, amen. Well, and two, you know, it, it uh, this thing, when I preached on criticism the other night, um, there were some things that I saw with Moses that, it, in, I mean, I've, I've, I've known the story, I've seen the thing, but it just put it in a different light. And one of, one of the things is, is that when, when Moses um, responded wrong to the criticism, and criticism caused you to suffer, uh, you know, the, the, the people of Israel over and over and over again gave him trouble after trouble after trouble. Uh, you, you, you don't find him saying, hey, let's do this, and they say, okay, hot dog, let's do it. No, they bucked him every step of the way. And, it, you know, it's one thing, uh, you know, you think of a church like ours, a church of about 70 folks or a church that's 200 folks or a church that's 500 folks or a church that's 1,000 folks. Whoa, whoa, that's how about one to three million people <laughs> and just, just, you know, just uh, rebellious, fighting God every step of the way. And yet when he responded right to those things, God blessed him. When he responded wrong, look what he lost. I mean, he was supposed to go into that promised land, and he would have, but he didn't respond right. And that's why, you know, I really emphasize, uh, and I know, I know, you know, we're all going to blow it at one time or another, but uh, we need to really be cognizant of the fact that when we go through difficulties and when we go through sufferings and trials, it's so important that we stay close to God and it's so important that we, we respond properly because you, you never know what blessings God's got for you on the other side of the response, on the other side of the irritation or the sufferings or the difficulty. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, illustrations? Yeah, Justin. How many of you have ever had, and my hand will go up, okay, just so you know. How many of you ever had the wrong reaction to a loss in your life and you didn't even come close to losing what Job lost? Let me see your hands. Yeah, mine's way up. In fact, here's two. Um, the, truth, the truth is Job uh, responded right. I mean, he really did. And uh, that's why it was so tough when his ha-ha friends came by and started, you know, pouring him over the coals uh, over the whole thing. It was, it, that was difficult for him to handle, and rightfully so. Rightfully so, because he knew, he knew he had responded properly. Now, did he struggle? Sure, he struggled. But he spoke, he did not sin, and he, and he, and he spoke right about God. Any others? Okay, get out your prayer list, if you would, tonight.